someone you're remembering especially today, or just the pace of your own breath? Will you find a comfortable place in your seat and take a few easy breaths as we shed, settle into our shared silence together? Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Our prayer this morning comes to us from Carol Alman Morton. Spirit of life. God of many names and no name. On Father's Day, we honor those people who have been teachers, confidants, and friends. We acknowledge that it is not biology that makes a parent, but love and attention and care. For those of us that have lost a father or a child, we hold their memories in our hearts. For all of us who are fathers, we ask for continued help in discerning how best to care for our children, whether they are five or 50 years old. For all of us who nurture, who nourish, who parent, who teach and care, and support. May the strands of relationship between ourselves and all of creation grow ever stronger. May all of us, no matter our place in the cycle of life, experience nurture and love, and may we pass on that love to all those we encounter on our paths. 
we ask these things for ourselves, for those we love, and for those we do not love. Amen. Our reading this morning comes to us from the poet Mary Oliver. The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. There are some Sundays like today that I think of as extra holy. When a confluence of holidays and celebrations meet and wash over us like waves, like rivers, Today, we're celebrating pride, we're honoring Juneteenth, we're lifting up Father's Day and the summer sol solstice, the longest day and the shortest night of the year. What a holy day. What a confluence of opportunities to rejoice. Sunflowers are my absolute favorite 
flower. In the morning, their faces look east. And as the sun tracks across the sky, they turn their faces to follow it. Tournesol in French, girasol in Spanish, girasole in Italian, these sun turners is what they're called in romance languages. And they are exhibiting, for those who appreciate a little botany lesson in their religious experience, a phenomenon called heliotropism. They move and grow toward the light. When I was young, I used to imagine that these sun turners are the ones who cause the sunrise and the sunset. That it is not them following the sun, but the other way around. That through their adoration, through turning their faces upward and moving together from east to west, they cause the earth to turn and the sun to track across the sky. Through the sheer power of their dreaming together, their single-minded focus on the object of their love and nourishment, fields of sunflowers all the way around the world took turns through their mighty yearning to turn the earth around and around and around. Juneteenth was Friday, the day that formerly enslaved people learned that they had won their freedom two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation had been written. Also known as Real Independence Day, this is the day that the news was delivered to those formerly enslaved people in Texas. What good is a decree a thousand miles away if it doesn't make its way to the ears of the people who need to hear it? This is the day they learned that the freedom which was their birthright, the freedom they had dreamed of had been won for their lives in their lifetime no longer just a dream to harbor in secret and pass on to their children, but here and real and always already theirs. The first pride was a riot at the Stonewall Inn in New York City. Last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary. And in that sermon on our Pride Sunday, I told you that Marsha P. Johnson was a drag queen. But after the service, I was corrected. She was a transgender woman. She was a trans woman of color at that targeted extra by the police raids, the authorities of the day cracking down on anything perceived as deviance. She was an activist and a freedom fighter and for that she is honored. But doesn't your heart break for the people who saw so much struggle? People who deserved to lie unbothered with their faces turned toward the sun. This week, we saw some good news from the Supreme Court some decisions about DACA, about employment protections for queer and trans folks. And when these decisions came out, it is possible that you personally breathed a sigh of relief for yourself, for your family, for your loved ones, for your friends and neighbors and strangers who deserve to live free. If that sigh of relief was particularly close, held tight in your chest. Hear me now. That breath out is air you never should have had to hold in. That relief in your shoulders is a weight you should never have had to carry. These freedoms, these temporary legal wins that do matter, that do have a real impact in the lives of real people were always already yours. In 
in the aftermath of these uprisings, the last few weeks uprisings about police brutality against Black people, we've seen a lot of empty gestures and a lot of symbolic victories or offerings attempting to placate those who have had enough. We have seen the naming of streets, the murals, the eight minutes of silence by elected officials, the possibility of the introduction of federal holidays. None of these things are on their own are wrong or bad, and some might even be welcome and joyful, but they are no substitute for the lasting change that is being demanded all around us. And we have seen this before. The banks who now make rainbow patterned credit cards, but foreclose on the homes of poor people, trans people, people of color, sex workers, we have seen this before. When we think we're getting a little bit closer to a piece of the pie, this is an opportunity to tamp down rebellion and the rage um, thriving righteously around us. Whenever there is a riot or a rebellion or an uprising or some other declaration of the practice of freedom that is always already ours. There is the swift response to pacify. But we reflected on this last week a little bit indirectly that that poem also from Mary Oliver, Joy Was Not Made to Be a Crumb. Accept not the crumbs offered to you in the response to rebellion. To borrow a concept from Adrienne Marie Brown, where you are born into struggle, do not be bought off when it seems like something is easing up for you. Where you are born into relative privilege, do not be tricked into thinking your humanity is intact if your neighbor is persecuted. There is much to celebrate, but there is still much to be won. We've been reflecting over the last few weeks about the histories that are not formally taught to us in many of our schools and the reasons why the truths about uprising go buried. Freedom in the political, economic, and social sense is not given or granted. It is seized and won and safeguarded. But freedom in the spiritual sense is also practiced moment to moment in the heart, in your own body, in communities here and now. And it looks like a lot of different things. It can be subversive. It can cause some disturbance and some confusion to those who are not directly in the know. According to Excuse me. According to lore, the P in Marsha P. Johnson's name stands for pay it no mind. When people bothered her about her gender expression and identity, that was her response. Pay it no mind. How I hear that is, you cannot make me explain myself to you. That is a practice of freedom. And the upending of the things we thought we knew, the refusal to categorize and to be categorized, the challenge to binaries, to institutions and habits that keep us small and isolated from one another, all of these things are a practice of freedom. The practice of freedom can be messy and it can be confusing for many of us but it does lead to rejoicing. 
remember that the practice of freedom, the people who are the most marginalized, could pull the earth around on its axis. Remember also that the practice of freedom for those who have socially, materially, economically the least freedom is a threat to the order of the day. And so of course it stands to reason that those stories and the, that riotous rejoicing goes untold. And it is our work as people of faith, people who seek what is holy, and place it in the middle of our lives to uncover and to tell those stories. Perhaps there will be some confusion, but my friends, there also is much rejoicing. When one of you gave me that history lesson last year about Marsha P. Johnson, I was admittedly a little embarrassed to have been wrong, but then I rejoiced. When some of you came to the board of our church and said, how welcome am I really with these gendered bathrooms? You may remember that in that moment, we did not immediately know what to do, but then we changed the signs and we rejoiced. On Friday, when the Juneteenth fireworks lit up my beautiful, multiracial, gentrifying, complicated neighborhood, I confess to you that I was mildly irritated at the late hour. But then I shut my windows to go to sleep and I rejoiced. When you are in your car and a protest shuts down the highway, perhaps you are inconvenienced or confused, but you also can choose to rejoice at the practice and the promise of freedom around you. When more and more children are coming out at younger and younger ages as gender fluid and gender creative, perhaps you are initially confused, but then you remember that these are children who discover themselves earlier than adults had permission to. These are children who will be supported and nurtured, children who feel safe, children who are surrounded by the love and the care and the affirmation that they deserve. And I know that there is much rejoicing. When it is you speaking up for yourself, when it is you drawing your boundaries, when it is you refusing to debate your own humanity anymore, when you come out, when you place your hand on the rope to topple the statues of the slavers, when you feel the strength and the struggle of those who came before you, rejoice. Even when your voice trembles, when your heart hurts, when your feet ache, remember that the solstice sun, the blessed height of the growing season, is asking you insistently, what is it you are planning to do with your one wild and precious life? And remember that your bold living is an answer. When you are drawn again, or for the first time, into struggles for freedom, when you had not previously known that it is a fact that there is no freedom unless we all are free, when the comforts of your life had deluded you into believing that you were safe and separate when your neighbor suffers, when the veil has been lifted, when you arrive finally at the struggle in which you also belong, rejoice. Because the blessed height of the growing season and the beauty of the solstice sun is asking you also, what is it you are planning to do with your one wild and precious life? And your bold living is an answer too. So wherever you find yourself in the story of these freedom struggles, if the earth feels like it's shuddering on its axis, rejoice. It is nothing more and nothing less than the sheer force of the human spirit 
the oppressed rising up, the persecuted saying no more, all of us pulling our parts of the earth into the light and turning our faces toward the sun. So may it shine on each of us exactly the way we are as the promise of pride and freedom that is always already ours and always being one. May it be so, and amen.